car is speeding on a college campus, and you are one of two eyewitnesses. Afterwards, the two of you discuss what you saw. How might the discussion affect your memory? And how does eyewitness memory relate to this man's story, a story about kidnapping and murder? And how do we explain this woman's false memory, that as a child she was lost and afraid? Cognitive psychologist Elizabeth Loftus says to answer these questions, we need to understand how memory works. Loftus says memory is changeable, malleable, and that we reconstruct it over time. You don't just record the event and then play it back later the way a videotape would work. The process is much more complex. Uh, and one of the things that affects memory and, and the accuracy of memory is new information or new details or, or new ideas that come along uh, after some experience is completely over. So after witnessing this on-campus driving, the two eyewitnesses might have different opinions as to what happened. One might have inaccurate, misleading information, and that could influence the other. That misleading information can enter their, their memory system and can cause an alteration or a distortion or a contamination in memory, they start to believe that they experience the misinformation themselves. In the laboratory, Loftus's early research demonstrated this. After a subject watched a car go through a stop sign, simple suggestions by an experimenter convinced many that the car had gone through a yield sign. We can do that fairly easily. And in the real world, when a police officer says to an eyewitness, Mrs. Jones said it happened this way, what do you think? The suggestion that Mrs. Jones might be right can influence eyewitness memory. So people have to be careful in all kinds of situations that they don't contaminate the memories of individuals from whom they're trying to get good information. In fact, a guideline to police from the Justice Department suggests... You separate witnesses. You don't let them overhear what each other says because of this problem of potential contamination. Eyewitness memory contamination affected the life of Howard Haupt. Tried for kidnapping and murdering a child, a jury acquitted him, in part because Loftus testified that police questioning may have altered eyewitness memory. But countless others are not as lucky ending up in jail for years for crimes they did not commit. When you analyze those cases, the most common reason for a wrongful conviction is faulty eyewitness memory. Somebody testified uh, as a witness about their memory and that memory was wrong and it led to an innocent person being convicted of a crime that they didn't do. But me memory is even more malleable than that. You can get be people to believe that they've had entire experiences when they were younger that they didn't have. Mommy, where are you? I can't find you. This woman is writing about being lost as a child. The next thing I knew, I was surrounded by strangers and got really scared. I cried for my parents and someone noticed me and took me back to them. In fact, she was never lost. But listen to what the experimenter says when first meeting her. Uh, today I'd like you to write about some experiences from your childhood. I talked with your parents about this and they told me some specific events that happened to you. Aaron's parents were contacted, and they did suggest some real experiences, like a special birthday party. But they also said Aaron was never lost. The experimenter made this up to demonstrate the power of suggestive information. The memory of being lost results from the suggestion that parents said it really happened. Widely known as the lost in the mall study, since that's where subjects are usually told they were lost, the taller bars show that over three separate sessions, 68% of subjects remembered the real experiences provided by their parents. But the shorter bars show you the percentage of subjects who remember something about the false experience. Other false experiences that subjects have been convinced to remember include placing a sticky substance into a teacher's desk and almost drowning and having to be saved by a lifeguard. But the real purpose of such studies is to illustrate how suggestive interviewing and information can influence memory in real life. There have been in the past psychotherapists who unfortunately uh, like to say to their patients or clients, you know everyone I've seen with those symptoms was sexually abused as a child and maybe something like that happened to you. 
and with enough suggestion that perhaps there's some sexual abuse in the history of the client or patient, some of these individuals have come to believe that they were molested by people that didn't do anything to them, uh, that they sometimes had extreme experiences like uh, being molested in satanic cults where they were forced into animal sacrifice. All of which has led Loftus to the following conclusion. Just because somebody reports a memory to you that's very detailed and very confident and about which they're very emotional doesn't mean it really happened. 